All right, we're going to let people um, join and then we'll go ahead and get started in about a minute. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So hi and welcome to the Conversations About COVID seminar series. I'm Jesse Bark, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Faculty in the Department of Behavioral and Community Health Sciences. Um, we're winding down towards the end of the term, um, believe it or not, um, and the end of this seminar series. Um, Unfortunately, we need to revisit our plans for the last session um, and we have a couple of options. So we could end after next week's presentation or I could get audience input on what topics you're interested in and I can explore setting up speakers to address one of those topics. So given that I'm in the field of community engagement and participatory research, I'm gonna go with that option um, and ask you guys um, who are viewing today um, if you have ideas about what we should do for the session on November 13th, um, please send me an email directly to jgburk at pit.edu. Um, so that's jgburke at pit.edu. All right, so now back to the structure for today's session. Following my introductions, um, the speaker, we actually only have one today, um, will address the topic and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Um, when we get to that portion, please use the Q&A function to ask your questions and I'll help to moderate the discussion. Please also note that we're recording this seminar. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Wendy Braun is a preventive medicine physician with expertise in public health practice and education, health policy, and medical education. Since July of this year, she served as the Pennsylvania Department of Health's COVID-19 response director. Prior to that, she was director of the Center for Public Health Practice, associate dean for practice, and professor of health policy and management here at Pitt Public Health. Um, we're really happy to have her back. Um, previously, she served as Wyoming State Health Officer and Public Health Division Administrator for the Wyoming Department of Health. And during her tenure there, she led the state's public health emergency preparedness, response, and recovery efforts. Um, so we're really thrilled to have you here, Dr. Braun. Um, I'll now turn it over to you to start our conversation about Pennsylvania's response to COVID-19. I'll stop sharing and then you can um, go ahead and share your slides. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon. Um, I am delighted uh, to have been asked uh, back to participate uh, in this COVID conversations series. Um, as Jesse said, I'm Wendy Braund. Um, uh, many of you know me as a recent Pitt Public Health faculty member. Um, on July 1st, um, I started in a newly created uh, position at the Pennsylvania Department of Health as the COVID-19 response director. Um, it, uh, it's a new um, deputy secretary, secretary uh, position. Um, and in that role, I provide uh, strategic guidance uh, to our hardworking team in the department's operations center or DOC um, that compiles and analyzes the data and leads the Commonwealth's response, of course, in conjunction with many partners. Um, to contain and mitigate the impacts of COVID-19. So like, um, like the other states, uh, Pennsylvania was given uh, multiple supplemental federal grants uh, to support the COVID-19 re uh, response, including a $350 million uh, dollar supplement um, 
to the epidemi and laboratory, epidemiology and laboratory capacity uh, annual grant, uh, the enhancing detection um, supplement. Um, and that has really allowed us to bring on staff and upgrade um, IT systems and really enhance critical infrastructure um, to support our response. And so all of that uh, is, my, uh, is under my purview. So uh, just a little bit um, of the numbers to kind of um, set, set, the, set the stage. Um, uh, we, we, the nation, and certainly uh, Pennsylvania, are, are clearly in the fall resurgence um, that, that you know, everybody uh, knew would be coming. Um, we have uh, uh, um, 202,876 total cases of COVID-19 um, in Pennsylvania. That is up 2,200. 2,202 from the day before. Oh, and I should mention these uh, statistics are, are yesterday's stats, not today. So the, so the uh, dashboard that you're viewing um, is actually yesterday's dashboard. Um, so 193,611 um, cases are confirmed. That number is up uh, 1,965 from the day before, and there are 9,265 probable cases. That number is up 237. Probable cases are 4.6% of all cases. 61% um, of those cases uh, qualify uh, that they, they meet the symptom and exposure criteria. And 32% are due to positive antigen, antigen tests. So at the current time, um, a, a, COVID, a positive uh, COVID-19 test done by an antigen test um, is considered a probable test, um, not a confirmed test. Um, and of course, uh, increased adoption of point of care antigen testing um, will continue to drive up uh, the probable cases. Um, percent positivity of COVID-19 PCR tests, and this is specific to, to PCR tests, is over 10% and increasing in all regions of Pennsylvania. Um, current uh, percent positivity for the Southwest region is 10.1. Um, in the Northwest, Northeast, and Southeast, um, and the state uh, are all at uh, 11 to 11.5. And in the South Central and the North Central, uh, percent positivity is uh, 13 to 13.4 percent. And um, this, there are different ways to, to calculate percent po positivity. Uh, the method that we use for our dashboard um, counts each case only once over the entire epidemic and reflects people who, re who were reported for the first time in each seven day period. Um, 1,187 persons are currently hospitalized for COVID-19. That is up uh, 17 um, from yesterday. Another number uh, that we are tracking very, very carefully, um, the trend in the 14-day moving average uh, of the number of hospitalized patients um, has increased by nearly 500 uh, patients in the past three to four weeks. Um, our ICU admissions um, are also on the rise. Um, I will note, however, though, um, that compared uh, to the spring, uh, when we had equal case numbers, our uh, hospital, our numbers of folks who are hospitalized are much lower, um, and their um, um, and their length of stay um, is generally shorter. Um, and that, of course, uh, you know, just demonstrates uh, the improved ability of our health system, um, you know, having learned uh, how to care for COVID-19 more effectively, at, you know, as well as, um, as well as the use of um, therapeutics. So um, as far as our case demographics, and, and all of these graphics, um, by the way, are, are from the Pennsylvania COVID-19 um, dashboard, which is a great, uh, great resource updated daily um, with, with lots of different um, statistics. Uh, so I encourage you, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with that, which I'm sure many of you are, um, to go uh, dig around there. So um, in terms of cases, uh, there are somewhat more female cases than male, 54% uh, uh, compared to 45. Um, to date, 42% uh, of those cases are uh, 50 years or older. 
um, and 21% are over 65. Um, in June and July, um, and then uh, the end of August, of course, um, there was a striking increase in the proportion of cases in college-aged young adults, uh, age 19 to 24 in most parts of the states, a phenomenon which, with which uh, you pit folks, of course, are, are, are familiar. It was entirely predictable uh, that when we brought, uh, brought students back, back to campus, um, we were, you know, we were going, we were going to see um, outbreaks. I, you know, I know, uh, having been part of um, Pitt's planning um, in terms of, uh, you know, the educational uh, environment, um, you know, there was very careful planning. Um, but frankly, the problem is not about what kids do in the classroom. It, it, and, and you all know that, you're public health folks. You know, the, the problem is really all the hours um, that our students are not in the classroom um, and, and uh, potentially not social distancing and not masking and um, engaging in, in other adolescent behaviors, uh, you know, that increase, increase their risk. So, um, and then of course in September, the proportion of cases age 19 to 24 just shot up. Um, but, but since then uh, has been decreasing um, in October to date, the proportion of cases um, who were young adults um, has decreased in all regions um, except, um, except uh, the Northwest. Um, not, uh, not unpredictably, um, cases 65 and above um, have again started increasing um, in most regions, um, particularly um, in uh, the North Central, South Central, and Southwest. Um, we don't have great data on race and, race and ethnicity associated with COVID-19 cases um, in Pennsylvania, even though, uh, you know, those demographics are among the mandatory elements, um, you know, that, that uh, reporters um, should be entering uh, when, they, when they put their, um, their case uh, uh, results into NEDS. Um, at this time, approximately uh, 58 to 62 percent of cases um, have race demographic data. And so, uh, let's see, so you see this gray bar here um, represents, uh, you know, all the cases for which that information is unknown. And about 56% have, have ethnicity uh, reported. So again, all of these cases, um, we do not know, um, we do not know uh, ethnicity of those folks. And we are undertaking um, several efforts uh, to improve these data, um, and which I would be delighted um, to, to discuss, uh, you know, during the question and answer period, um, if there's an interest. Um, tragically, uh, we have had um, 8,506 deaths uh, in cases, um, of uh, COVID-19 uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, this includes um, 8,405 um, confirmed, uh, deaths in 8,405 confirmed and 101 probable, ca probable cases. Our overall um, death rate among reported cases in Pennsylvania is 4.2. Um, almost 68% of our reported deaths have been associated um, with long-term care facilities um, and personal care homes. Um, so of course we, uh, you know, we are watching um, as uh, very carefully, uh, you know, as, um, as the uh, cases uh, in our uh, older Pennsylvanians um, are on the rise. Um, and as we uh, can see increasing um, outbreaks, uh, you know, in those long-term care facilities. Um, we do have uh, much better death data compared um, to case data when it comes to race and ethnicity. Um, and if this, um, you know, if, if you were looking at this graphic in real time um, and you hovered over um, this bar, uh, for example, um, you would see that we, ha that we have had 1,716 COVID-19 uh, related deaths among African-Americans. And, and compared to, um, Compared uh, to the number um, of African Americans um, who uh, who make up um, uh, the percentage of African Americans of Pennsylvanians, um, the number of deaths um, is 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 far disproportionately high compared to uh, you know the percentage um, uh, of the population. 
So, um, so now let's look at uh, Pennsylvania's response, um, starting, of course, with our efforts at containment. First, of course, um, is case investigation and contact tracing. Um, Core, core public health that we do um, for, you know, for infectious diseases. Um, we are in the process of hiring on um, 75 additional nurses um, as DOH employees and 50 uh, additional contractual case investigators um, to supplement the core of existing nurses, disease investigators, and public health physicians um, currently doing that work. Um, the uh, opportunity and a financial wherewithal to hire that large number of nurses, which has been challenging, frankly, uh, attracting nurses from the private sector where they can make much more, is just a tremendous boon for the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Uh, you know, our numbers have just, uh, employee numbers have just, you know, gone down and down and down, and, uh, inc including and especially our nursing staff. So this is just an enormous um, improvement. But even still, uh, you know, we've recently had to start um, prioritizing case investigation because the case investors and case investigators just can't get to all the cases, um, you know, within a window of time needed for public health intervention. Um, we do have 1,423 contact tracers who are monitoring 10,930 contacts. Uh, last week, so Sunday, October 18th through uh, Saturday, October 24th, 30% um, of all cases um, had investigations done uh, within, or excuse me, begun within 24 hours of first report, uh, which is unfortunately down 5% uh, from the previous week. 10% um, had investigations uh, begun within 24 to 48 hours, um, which is also down uh, slightly 1%. And 34% of all newly reported cases were successfully contacted by investigators. Let me say that again, 34%. So only a third of all the newly reported cases that, uh, that we got you know, from laboratory uh, data and clinicians um, our, our case investigators were only um, able to contact, you know, slightly over a third of them. More and more people are refusing to answer the phone or hang up um, when call, you know, when the caller uh, identifies um, uh, themselves as uh, as Department of Health um, staff, you know, which is really, really a problem. Um, just this morning, uh, you know, our, um, we put out a, a communication uh, message uh, excuse me, it was yesterday, um, uh, that was, uh, the theme was answer the call, um, encouraging folks, um, you know, to, to respond, uh, you know, when a case investigator or, or contact tracer um, um, calls you uh, so that we can, um, you know, get in, get in touch with all the folks um, who have potentially been, um, uh, been exposed. Um, we now also have uh, the COVID Alert PA app, um, which is assisting us um, in our case investigation and contact tracing efforts uh, using Bluetooth technology uh, to, to determine if someone is exposed uh, to someone um, who tested positive. Um, and so the app is just really an essential tool um, in these processes um, so that we can, uh, you know, it's another tool to help us work um, to contact, uh, you know, all those who may um, um, have been exposed to a case. The app has also um, been helpful in, in filling in gaps in demographic data um, through self-report self uh, by app users. And as of uh, this morning, we've had 389,000 people um, download the app. So um, uh, just briefly, I'll, I'll explain how it works. Um, so once you download the app, as I, as I mentioned earlier, it uses Bluetooth um, to sense when you spend more than 10 minutes within six feet of another person with the app. And this is considered close contact. So the app ignores uh, people who just walk by you or, or are standing more than six feet away from you. And when your app uh, senses a close contact, your phone exchanges a secure random code with the other person's phone, assuming, of course, that other person has downloaded the app. Um, and your phone stores uh, this close contact random code in a list. And um, I want to emphasize that the codes are random. They don't reveal any information about you or the other person. The app doesn't collect or share any names, locations, or phone numbers. Um, and then if you test positive for COVID-19, um, of course, a public health representative um, 
uh, case investigator uh, will call you, uh, you know, just as soon as possible. Um, and the representative will ask you if you're willing to share your app's list of close contact random codes uh, to help protect other people. Um, sharing your list is optional. Um, we hope that you'll do it, <laughs> of course, um, so that you know to so that the app will work. Um, and sharing your list is secure and private. Um, the app never reveals, uh, you know, who you are to anyone. And then each day, um, every phone that has the app compares its own list of close contact random codes to the list of random codes associated with a positive COVID nineteen diagnosis. And if there's a match, the app displays a COVID alert. Um, so th obviously the more people who use the app, uh, the larger the network um, of, of potential individuals who benefit it. So please, if you haven't already done it, uh, download the COVID alert uh, PA, PA app today. Encourage your, your friends, your families, your students uh, to do it as well. Um, the app uses um, the Association of Public Health Laboratories, or APHL's, informatics messaging services platform, or the AIMS platform, which is actually um, the platform um, that is used uh, for reporting electronic lab reports um, to health departments. And APHL has partnered with Google and Apple and Microsoft um, to create the national key server. So the app is interoperable across participating states, um, which currently include Colorado, Delaware, DC, Nevada, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, North Dakota, Pennsylvania, and Wyoming. So if I were foolish enough to go visit my friends in Wyoming, um, where they have a uh, an enormously high um, case rate and percent positivity, um, uh, you know, and and uh, I had been exposed um, to somebody, uh, you know, the, the app, even though it's the COVID alert PA app, you know, it would work. Um, and I would be alerted of my exposure in, in Wyoming. Um, California and Michigan are, are piloting an exposure notification app um, with a limited population that is also on the national key server um, uh, so that it would work in those uh, limited locations as well. Um, so before we leave the topic of isolation and quarantine um, and, uh, you know, associated with, with, with case investigation and contact tracing, um, I want to briefly touch on the definitions um, that the department uses. A case uh, is someone uh, who is a known or probable positive case of COVID-19. And cases must isolate or remove themselves from contact with others for 10 days and until fever-free without the use of antipyretics and, and improved symptoms. A close contact is a person who is within six feet of a person with COVID-19 for greater than 15 minutes during that person's period of infectivity, which is, which is defined as two days prior to uh, their symptoms starting, or if they never had symptoms, uh, two days uh, prior to their positive test result. And close contacts must quarantine or stay home um, and separated from others to the extent possible for 14 days. And you cannot test your way out of quarantine. So you get a negative test at day seven and you say, okay, that's my get out of jail, jail free card. You are wrong. Um, you must uh, quarantine for 14 days. Um, now, <laughs> the reason I bring this up is because, as many of you may know, uh, the CDC recently updated their definition of close contact uh, to someone who is within six feet of an infected person for a cumulative total of 15 minutes or more over a 24-hour period, and the rest of the definition is the same. Um, it, this is very challenging to operationalize. Um, so we at the Department of Health are maintaining our current def definition um, with the caveat that, that there are always special circumstances um, that would add nuance um, to who our case investigators would um, consider a close contact. And the, um, the study uh, upon which um, CDC, the single study <laughs> upon which CDC um, based their new case definition had some pretty um, uh, specific, um, it was a very specific situation um, that is, you know, completely understandable why, um, how they defined it the way they did. But in terms of day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, case operas, opera, 
civilization, <laughs> excuse me, um, that's very challenging and certainly a question that um, you know, has really started to come up uh, with our stakeholders. So another key uh, containment strategy, of course, is testing. Um, we continue to expand our testing uh, capabilities across the Commonwealth, and presently we have 537 uh, testing locations. Um, these sites are supplemented by temporary uh, testing um, sites and pop-up testing events. Um, we really are uh, doing a lot of uh, testing in Pennsylvania. As of Wednesday, we, excuse me, we had received 34,402 PCR test results and 3,698 3, antigen test results. The department has received a daily average of 32,880 PCR tests and 2,230 antigen tests over the past 30 days. So, uh, so we are seeing an increasing number um, of antigen tests um, being reported. There are enormous challenges um, with the reporting of antigen test results, um, another topic we can certainly um, discuss um, later. Um, from March through October, October 28th, we have received 3,964,772 PCR results, which roughly equates to testing 31% of Pennsylvania's population population. But um, we are not uh, satisfied with that. Uh, we will be making a considerable investment uh, to bring additional testing capacity um, for every county uh, across the Commonwealth in, in the coming months. Um, and more and more of our facilities and sites are offering point of care testing. Um, including uh, long term care facilities uh, that received um, point of care testing machines directly uh, from the Depart US Department of Health and Human Services. Um, also, our Bureau of Labs uh, recently initiated a serology test uh, protocol, protocol, excuse me, um, and we recently uh, deployed a survey on language capability um, to our testing centers um, to determine the need um, for additional resources um, to reach our diverse populations. Uh, you probably uh, also heard um, that the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, bought all of the 150 million available Abbott Binax Now test cards uh, to expand rapid testing across the U.S. Um, test cards were distributed um, by the federal government directly to uh, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, um, home health and hospice agencies, um, historically black colleges and universities, or HBCUs, the Indian Health Service, um, and states recovering from natural disasters. HHS is also sending test cards directly to health departments um, according to a population-based formula. So uh, we anticipate getting about 3.85 million of these antigen um, test cards um, before the end of 2020. Um, which is roughly uh, 250,000 a week, um, which we then distribute um, to facilities and healthcare providers um, to test uh, target populations, including um, individuals living in congregate care settings, um, such as skilled nursing facilities, um, personal care homes and prisons, um, K to 12 students, uh, teachers and staff, um, college and university uh, students, faculty and staff, um, daycare center staff and clients, uh, both children and adults, um, individuals without permanent housing, food workers and other critical workforce employees and first responders. And um, the logistics associated um, with um, uh, receiving um, the, those tests, uh, you know, coming up with the, the formula for who gets them every week. We have a, we, we base it on, we do them by county and we base it upon um, uh, the number, number of case, incidence rate of the cases. Um, but then, you know, figuring out um, which facilities are going to receive them and getting them shipped out. And it's just a very uh, complex um, logistical issue. Uh, another key containment, uh, uh, containment strategy um, is PPE, uh, you know, to limit um, exposure. 
Um, the state has a stockpile of PPE uh, to keep our healthcare workers um, safe or, or at least decrease uh, the likelihood um, you know, of them being exposed. Um, and to date, uh, we have distributed um, 5 million 450,585 and 95 masks, 824,866 gowns, 2 million 960 45 procedural masks, 8,603,040 pairs of gloves, and 1,305,170 face shields. Um, and we, you know, we continue, uh, we continue to um, procure um, PPE uh, so that we can, uh, we can continue to, to push it out um, to our providers and facilities as needed. So now let's talk about mitigation strategies. Of course, uh, we continue uh, the message about hand hygiene and cough and sneeze etiquette and physical distancing. Um, Secretary Levine issued a universal face covering order on July 1st. Um, and on, on July 15, uh, the governor and Secretary Levine um, issued a targeted mitigation order um, affecting bars and restaurants, uh, closing nightclubs, um, establishing limits on the number of persons at events and gatherings, um, encouraging teleworking, and directing gyms and fitness centers to prior prioritize outdoor fitness, fitness activities. Uh, you know, of course, an activity that is going to become uh, less and less possible um, as the winter uh, as the winter. Uh, comes near. Um, that order uh, was amended on October 16th uh, with respect um, to gathering limits. And finally, school closures. So uh, the Department of Health uh, worked with uh, the department, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Education, PDE, um, to issue reopening guidance uh, at the beginning of the school year. Um, and shortly thereafter, uh, developed uh, this matrix of recommended instructional models for three K, pre K through twelve schools, um, and it's based upon the COVID nineteen um, incidence rate per hundred thousand, and PCR percent positivity um, in a county over the most recent seven days. Um, and these are recommendations, of course. Uh, so districts may or may not um, follow them. Um, but essentially, um, if uh, your level of transmission is low, according to, uh, according to those two parameters, then it is recommended um, that you go fully in person um, or in a blended model. Moderate uh, would be blended or um, full remote. And then if you're in substantial, um, then, uh, that, then a full remote uh, learning model is recommended. Um, we continue to see new cases of COVID-19 among school-aged children, uh, those aged 5 to 18. Um, the percent of cases we are seeing among 13 to 18-year-olds um, over September and October is higher than it has been um, since the start of the pandemic. Uh, we continue to work closely with our colleagues at PDE um, to investigate and mitigate outbreaks in in. Uh, K through 12 uh, settings, as well as working with col colleges and universities to address the number of outbreaks among 19 to 24 year olds. Um, and I just would note uh, that the data that inform the recommended instructional models come from the early warning monitoring dashboard, another part of the Pennsylvania COVID-19 um, dashboard. And this is the dashboard that uh, you may recall uh, went from uh, red to yellow to green um, during the phased uh, reopening. Um, and of course, it, 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 that also uh, used incidence rates and percent positivity. And you can see now, you know, the whole state uh, is green. <clears throat> Um, I want to touch briefly um, on the two therapeutics of which health departments have been or will be involved um, in distribution. Um, remdesivir uh, is an antiviral um, that HHS, uh, in addition you know, to, to the other avenues of, of hospitals and providers being able to get it, um, HHS, HHS excuse me, initially shipped uh, remdesivir to health departments. And then uh, we were charged with allocating it to health departments free of charge uh, based on a formula 
um, related to the number of patients uh, with COVID-19 and patient acuity. Uh, more recently, um, HHS has started shipping uh, remdesivir directly to hospitals, um, which now uh, have to pay for the medications. Um, but uh, health departments are, we are still involved um, in determining, uh, sort of broking, brokering the hospital's um, interest um, in purchasing uh, from HHS uh, some of our state's weekly allotment. Very recently, we learned that HHS would also be sending uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, to healthcare institutions with a focus on outpatient settings, um, and that state health departments are expected to play uh, a similar role um, in uh, brokering uh, institu healthcare institutions' um, interest uh, in, in getting the receiving the monoclonal antibodies um, in sort of a remdesivir part, uh, remdesivir uh, 2.0 role. So they wouldn't, the antibodies would not be coming to the health department, they'd be going um, to the health department, to the institutions, but that we would somehow be um, directing, directing that. Um, so this is a, a, this is a very new wrinkle. Um, and so we, uh, we are just now, um, Sorting out, uh, you know what, what, how we need to prepare for that, given the the very little um, information that HHS has uh, provided to us, and uh, and their history of um, changing the information that they provide uh, regularly. And finally. Uh, we are making plans uh, to receive, distribute, and deliver uh, the COVID nineteen vaccine, or more likely, vaccines. There are multiple vaccine candidates uh, in various stages of development, um, and it is possible that one or more will receive emergency youth auth use authorization uh, from the FDA, the US Food and Drug Administration, uh, before the end of 2020. Uh, this wouldn't mean, however, um, that vaccine would be widely available at that point. Um, rather, whichever and or whenever and whichever uh, vaccine hits the market first, um, it will be available in small quantities um, that would be administered to prioritized populations uh, as determined by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, such as healthcare providers, essential workers, individuals who are critical to maintaining national security, and those who live or work in long-term care facilities. And it is likely uh, that the quantities will be so small that we will even have to prioritize among the priority population. So this is work that we are uh, that we are engaged in um, right now. Um, we anticipate um, that um, that sometime in spring 2021, more doses of, of probably multiple COVID-19 vaccines will be available in quantities large enough uh, to hold mass vaccination clinics uh, to immunize the general public. And by the fall of 2021, um, COVID-19 uh, vaccination should be included among the regularly recommended vaccines as determined by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Now, those uh, timelines may be adjusted uh, a little farther into the future, given the fact that um, recently, of course, FDA um, was successful um, in, in getting the, the two-month um, delay um, uh, in, uh, obser in observing um, uh, patients in clinical trials two months after uh, their last dose uh, of an experimental um, vaccine in order to provide a longer period of time um, to observe uh, patients for, uh, you know, uh, potential um, adverse uh, consequences. Um, uh, in the meantime, uh, however, um, uh, the, the department is using our influenza max vaccination clinics as training exercises uh, for COVID-19 vaccination um, practice. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, vaccination process um, will be complicated uh, by the fact that most of the current vaccine uh, candidates are, are a two-dose series uh, with varying lengths of time between doses. Um, which will require uh, both careful tracking uh, to ensure uh, that all recipients get a second dose of the same vaccine as their first dose and at the correct interval. 
Um, the different vaccines are also, also have variable uh, temperature storage requirements, and many of our usual providers won't have the capability um, to store uh, the Pfizer ultra cold vaccine, for example, um, which is uh, which is the front runner at, at this point, at least what we're being told uh, to prepare for from. Uh, from HHS. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the, the effectiveness and safety profile won't be uh, fully established um, for vaccines uh, being produced under, uh, under an emergency youth author authorization. Um, so we're gonna need to gather data in real time, in real people, um, in communities. Uh, instead of, or in addition to, uh, the controlled environment um, of a vaccine trial. Um, until, until such time uh, that a critical mass of the population has received an effective uh, vaccine and we are able to achieve herd, herd immunity. Now this is real herd, herd immunity associated with vaccines, not, not the, not the uh, herd immunity being uh, promulgated uh, by Dr. Atlas um, and the folks at the White House. Uh, but at any rate, um, you know, by the time, uh, until such time that we are able to achieve herd immunity, which could be a year from now, um, we have a collective responsibility um, to protect our communities uh, from COVID-19 and, and absolutely be um, united in, in the fight to stop the spread of the virus. Um, you know, people are tired people are tired of the vaccine and they're tired of having to do these things, but, um, but it's just critical. Uh, we need to mask up, wash up, uh, maintain physical distancing, and please download the COVID PA alert app today. And I will, uh, I will stop there and uh, turn it over to uh, Jesse, Jesse for uh, a facilitated discussion. All right, and Jessie can get her camera sorted out and her video. Give me I, one second. Um, I thought that was I thought that was me. I was like, oh no, there's one more step I was supposed to do. <laughs> no, thank you so much, um, Wendy, for a comprehensive and really um, important insights into what's happening in our state um, and the reminders about um, you know what we need to continue doing, um, but how yeah. it is tiring. Um, and I know. And we just need to support each other in all of this too. Um, so I'm gonna encourage people to post their questions in the Q&A um, and I'm gonna get started going through a couple. Um, so there are two questions here already that are asking for a little more information about the contact tracing. So um, give me a second and I'll just go through one is who gets prioritized for contact tracing? And then the other is um, what happens when the investigators call and people don't answer their phone? Do they leave a message um, and what proportion call back? So just a little more detail about um, that process. Um, certainly the numbers of, you know, a third um, are only successfully yeah. contacted are, are shocking. So if you could just give us a little more detail, that would be great. Sure, sure. So, um, so we really just just recently um, started, uh, you know, started this this prioritization. Um, so, our first priority, of course, is is folks associated with an outbreak, you know, uh, where we see, uh, you know, a nidus of infection, and it's important, um, you know, to get uh, to get to as many folks who who could potentially um, have been exposed as possible. Um, and then, um, and then we, you know, we prioritize. Um, um, uh, you know, our, our vulnerable people in, uh, in vulnerable situations. Um, so certainly, uh, you know, congregate care settings um, where, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, one case is considered an outbreak. Um, you know, we really uh, prioritize those, um, you know, to make sure uh, that we are, that we are, uh, you know, Getting cases, uh, you know, just as just as soon as um, as soon as they reveal themselves, and of course, you know, we know that a lot of people, um, you know, are asymptomatic. A lot of people who are positive for COVID nineteen are are asymptomatic or pre symptomatic, um, and so that's why you know it's it's important to do um, to do comprehensive testing um, and and 
uh, robust contact tracing. Um, you know, an example of a change, a significant, actually a flipping of our prioritization is that um, early on in the, in the epidemic, um, we put a high priority on um, contact tracing um, of cases associated um, with folks who had died of COVID-19 because we were really trying to get a handle um, on, on, the, on the mortality um, associated uh, with, with the disease. And now um, that is our lowest that is our lowest priority. Um, not that we don't care, you know, any longer, uh, you know, about um, about you know the deaths associated with COVID nineteen. But but clearly, you know, with limited resources, you know, it's really important um, to to prioritize those folks, um, you know, where it is uh, most critical to be able to uh, provide timely uh, public health um, intervention. Um, and then the second question, um, you know, about case investigation and contact tracing is, so, uh, you know, the health department um, gets a result of a positive test that's turned over to a case investigation case investigator, he or she, um, you know, calls the person. Um, they do, in fact, leave a message, um, it, you know, if, if, uh, if, if, you know, the person doesn't answer. Um, and they will try, uh, you know, they'll try multiple times and multiple days, um, uh, you know, before, you know, before they give up. Um, once, uh, you know, once a, a case investigator is successful in, in contacting a case, um, you know, they, they ask them um, a series of, um, a series of questions um, to determine um, where their, where their exposures were, um, and, and, uh, and asks them to, um, to, uh, name the people that they remember that they were in contact with during the during the period, and the case investigator will say, you know, based on your case result, test result, you know, positive test result, it would have been between day X and day Y. Um, and uh, so we, you know, ask for a list of of contacts. Now, some folks will. Um, participate in sort of the um, exposure questions and then refuse to give contacts. Um, so we get, you know, there are lots of lots of permutations. Um, the exposure questions, of course, are important um, because that helps us inform um, where to do um, potential uh, interventions. You know, for example, we you know we ask folks about um, you know whether they've attended large gatherings and whether they've you know whether they've gone to bars and restaurants and and you know those kinds of things to sort of determine you know where where are there potential um, areas that we might really need to address because you know cases are going up. Um, so then, uh, then those names are turned over to the contact um, tracers, and those folks um, contact all those people on the list. Um, people are uh, are encouraged to sign up with um, Sarah Alert, which is a, an online monitoring system, mo a system of uh, monitoring symptoms. And now, of course, we you know we have the app, you know, that folks can can sign up for, you know, irrespective of of being a case or a contact. And we really focus hope that folks will do that when they get, um, you know, when, when they get a positive alert, you know, that they have been exposed, then that kicks them into the system, you know, where they, where they would get, um, where they would get, uh, you know, a call. Um, we also have just instituted an online, um, system for tracking of our case investigation um, that's called Salesforce. And that uh, system actually uh, can integrate with Sarah Alert um, to you know to to improve our analytics and improve our um, our ability um, you know to to track to track cases. But it really begins with people picking up the phone, and so that's why we really are starting have really started to push on this message of you know pick up the phone. Um, so yeah, sorry that was rather long winded, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was helpful to sort of um, provide the entire scope of how, who is prioritized and then um, how that contact happens. Um, so there are a couple other questions that are coming in here. One is specific about the decreased case fatality rate in the state and then mm -hmm. how is it possible to really parse out how much is due to improve therapeutics, how much is due to changing um, age demographics of infection, um, can you comment at all about um, what, you know, what work is going into understanding that and sort of your perception of it? Sure. You know, I really think it is multifactorial. 
you know, I mean, we, the health system has clearly learned a lot about taking care um, of, of COVID-19 patients. Um, and therefore, you know, the, the, the survival rate is higher. Um, we have also seen, uh, you know, of course, it's going in the opposite direction now, but, but you know, since the, at the beginning of the pandemic, when our case rates um, were very high in the elderly, particularly, uh, you know, in, in our um, long-term care settings, um, you know, those rates, you know, those cases were frequently associated with death because there are, you know, there are most frail and the most um, unable uh, to really, um, you know, survive the complications of COVID-19. Um, and so that, that has also contributed greatly to the decrease in uh, the fatality, case fatality rate, um, because we have seen proportionately more younger folks. And it's not that younger folks don't, you know, don't, can't get really sick or die, um, but it is much, but it is much less likely. Um, we are seeing, you know, our cases in our elders um, creep back up. Um, so again, that's another stat that we're really, you know, watching very carefully. Great. Um, so there's a question here that I also wondered about. Um, so I'm going to ask. Um, so the reasoning behind the one way aisles in the stores and the stairwells of buildings and directional signs and sort of um, where that came from and how important is it because as this um, post notes, sometimes you end up passing more people because, um, you know, you're trying to get in the same space. Um, so yep. if you where did those come from and is um, what's the science behind them? So they did not come from the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Um, <laughs> to my knowledge, there's no science behind them. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's science behind physical distancing, certainly, you know, um, uh, you know, as, based on, um, you know, this being, uh, being a respiratory virus and how far, you know, the droplets uh, seem to be likely to fly. Um, you know, that's, it's complicated, uh, you know, by the, the growing um, evidence about the aerosolization of the virus, you know, which makes the you know, this, the six feet, you know, less critical and more about sort of the, the potential density, you know, of the aerosolized virus, uh, you know, in a, and then that's more about, um, you know, sort of how uh, contained the setting is, you know, for example. Um, but I, but I, but the, you know, the idea behind sort of, you know, having those markers on the floor um, and having these one-way signs is really about behavioral training. You know, it's about trying to get people uh, to, 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 to take those behaviors and and uh, you know and internalize them and then have that be their regular way, right? I mean, you don't go to Aldi and um, you know go careening down you know the aisle in the wrong direction. Or you're not supposed to anyway, um, you know, so that you know people can can physical distance. But of course, you know, you see all the you, everybody sees those rebels in the grocery store who aren't following the the arrows on the floor. But, but the idea is really, you know, behavioral uh, training to get folks to, to practice physical distancing. And to be fair, they are good reminders of that we <laughs> yes. are in yes, um, are. <laughs> the middle of a pandemic and that we need to take these things into account, um, especially when doing routine activities. Um, uh -huh. So there are two questions here that touch on vaccines again. Um, uh -huh. And one is about um, the threshold of efficacy um, that would be needed to take it um, essentially to the market. And then the other is this piece of um, a hypothetical timeline. And I know you gave us, um, you know, the priority populations. If you could just talk a little bit more about um, sort of where we are in the vaccine development based on your understanding. Sure. Sure. So, um, there are um, multiple uh, vaccines in the in the pipeline. Um, you know, the two. Sorry, that's Max. 
<laughs> He's done with his peanut butter bone and ready for mama time. <laughs> so sorry, folks. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, the, so there are multiple vaccines in the pipeline. Um, uh, the one uh, single dose vaccine um, that was in the pipeline, the, the trials are actually temporarily um, stopped. You know, there were a couple big trials that were stopped. One has been restarted. Um, so uh, so the, the front runner um, that we're being told to prepare for, frankly, is the Pfizer ultra cold vaccine, um, you know, that requires minus 70 degree storage and dry ice. And, and, and you know, we have been told um, to, to have the capability to pre-position um, vaccine um, at multiple uh, there, one to five facilities across the state. Um, in and holding it in anticipation of it getting the EUA to give it to people. So, so the vaccines are they're already in production. So the you know the vaccine companies have um, have gambled um, on the fact that that if they hold large enough trials, uh, you know, in order to produce the results that they feel will make the FDA confident enough to give them an emergency use authorization because it's not going to be FDA approved. It will only have an emergency use authorization, which has a completely different threshold in terms of uh, its safety profile um, and its efficacy. Um, so, um, uh, you know, of course, we were hearing we needed to be ready, you know, by the election. Um, uh, you know, now, you know, now it's unlikely um, that we're going to vac we're, that we're going to actually um, see vaccine, uh, any sort of vaccine before the end of the year, or probably early next year. Um, and then it's going to be, you know, the, mid to late 2021, probably where there's where there's enough circulating vaccine, and there probably will be more than one, um, you know, that we're going to be able to, that we're going to be able to do mass vaccinations. Um, as sort of, as, you know, as far as the sort of minimum efficacy, uh, you know, I mean, w I have heard that, uh, you know, if they can get it over 50%, um, you know, that that's going to be allowable. It is likely, um, you, you know, that there will probably be, be subsequent vaccines, uh, you know, that are more effective than the first vaccine out of the gate. And so then it gets complicated, you know, with, uh, you know, you have to have the second dose of the same vaccine, but, you know, what happens if you give a different vaccine? So it's, um, it's just, it's, it's really complicated. Yeah, I think that that is um, sort of the whole thing, right? It's really yeah. complicated. Um, yeah. The science yeah. is changing yeah. and evolving. Um, yeah. But I appreciate you helping us to understand it, right? Um, sure. So sort sure. of trying to stay up to date. Um, so we're running out of time, but I'm going to ask you one final question. It's a bit of a zinger, so um, uh -oh. <laughs> I'm just going to do it. Um, so in your opinion, um, what's been the most important shortcoming in our ability to control the pandemic in Pennsylvania? Um, and so the questioner asked, you know, is it lack of adequate testing, contact tracing, compliance with isolation and quarantine recommendations, lack of leadership? super spreader events, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think your answer is going to be it's complicated and yeah. multifactorial, but if you could just comment on, um, I think if I could change it a little bit, sort of um, shortcomings and then successes uh -huh. too, right? Uh -huh. I think we're doing pretty well in many, in many respects. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So, um, so the answer is yes, it's all of those things. Um, you know, at Pennsylvania, like the rest of the states has really suffered from from a lack of federal guidance. You know, it's really been every state on its own. Now we I mean, we talk among states, you know, and we collaborate across states, particularly with states in our region. Um, but it but it has been really challenging for each state to have to, to figure it out on our own. Um, Pennsylvania, um, you know, has a, a proportionate um, higher percentage of older folks and a much higher number of nursing homes than many other states. And, um, and nursing homes are problematic settings, uh, you know, in terms of infection uh, control and prevention in general. Um, and so then when you put, um, you know, when you put a, a pandemic layered onto the challenges um, with, uh, with infection prevention and control in, in nursing homes in those critical populations, it's just a recipe for disaster. Um, and so Pennsylvania was hit really hard 
early on. Um, and so right now we are in the process of really analyzing, you know, what did we do then? What are we doing now? What was the character of the, of the disease then uh, and what is it now um, to really inform our steps going forward. And we have learned a lot, um, you know, and, and, um, and to look at nursing homes in, in particular, you know, we really have a, um, a, an effective program of, um, with a multifaceted program where we go in, you know, in rapid fire and, you know, do testing and do infection prevention and control and, and support staffing, um, you know, to really address, um, to really address uh, outbreaks, you know, as they occur. Unfortunately, we're seeing those numbers rise again. But you know, that's, that's because, you know, younger people, uh, you know, it, it's the staff who unwittingly bring the virus into the institution. Um, you know, and that's, that's just really, that's a tough thing to do. And that is where point of care testing uh, can really make a critical difference, you know, in terms of in terms of screening folks. All right, so sadly, we're out of time. Um, I just want to thank you um, and to thank everybody for participating in the conversation today. Um, I hope you'll join us again next Friday at four when two experts from the CDC National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, um, address how their national uh, personal protective technology lab has responded to the unique PPE challenges that have arisen during COVID-19. So that should be really interesting. Um, I also just really want to thank um, Dr. Braun for presenting and I want to make a special thank you to Max, I believe his name is, um, for <laughs> to tolerating us um, and encourage everybody to um, enjoy what seems to be a nice sunny day here. Um, and I will see you all again next week. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.